In this video, we're going to cover drug distribution. If you've seen the introduction to pharmacokinetics lecture, we went through an overview of the four important processes, A, D, M, E. And in the previous lecture, we discussed drug absorption, which is the process by which a drug enters the bloodstream from its site of administration. Once a drug enters the bloodstream, it's distributed throughout the body to its target tissues. So drug distribution is the process by which a drug exits the bloodstream and enters the extracellular fluid and tissues. It can be distributed throughout the body, including blood, adipose tissue, bone, muscles, and any other compartment. There are a number of factors that control this reversible drug transfer from one location to another. But before we get into these factors, let's talk about how body fluids are divided into compartments. This is important because we'll be discussing how drugs can spread beyond the bloodstream into different tissues and compartments. All right. So total body water refers to the sum of all water content in the body. It's approximately 60% of body weight. So of course, this varies depending on different factors such as age and body composition. Now, Body water gets distributed inside cells and outside cells. So if we think of the water inside all of the body cells as a single compartment, we get intracellular fluid, or ICF, which is approximately 40% of body weight. And all of the water outside the cells comes together to form the extracellular fluid, ECF, and it's about 20% of body weight. The cell membrane is what separates the ICF from the ECF, okay? Now, the extracellular fluid is the sum of the plasma volume and interstitial fluid. There are two subcategories of fluid in the ECF. Fluid inside vessels, plasma, and fluid outside vessels, interstitial fluid. The plasma volume represents a small portion of total body water, about 5%. Okay, there's also the transcellular compartment, which includes the cerebrospinal, peritoneal, and synovial fluids. It makes up a really tiny percentage. For now, we're going to focus on the ICF, the ECF, the interstitial fluid, and the plasma. Okay, so once a drug enters the body, it has the potential to be distributed into any of these three main compartments. Plasma, interstitial fluid, and the volume inside our entire body cells. Okay, so now that we've discussed body fluid compartments, let's subtract complexity and walk through the distribution process and the factors that influence it. The first factor involves the ability of the drug to move easily across cell membranes, the cell membrane of the blood vessel, into the interstitial fluid and enter the cell membrane of the target tissues or organs. And so drugs must cross cell membranes to enter or exit cells. They will cross the vascular endothelium. Now, what is the main component of the vascular endothelium? Lipid membranes. Okay, but what does this mean? Well, remember lipophilic means lipid loving. So let's show this out. If we have a free drug here that is highly lipid soluble, it's small and uncharged, it will be easier for this drug to cross lipid membranes, to cross the endothelium, and to enter various tissues. This drug can easily be distributed out of the blood into the tissues, and this would be a very high distribution. Smaller and uncharged molecules typically readily cross biological barriers more easily than larger molecules, allowing for greater tissue distribution. Now, what if we have a drug that is large, hydrophilic, and charged, or polar? Is it easy for this drug to pass through? Well, no. It'll be a lot harder, and you might need particular transporters. And so what effect does this have on distribution? If it's higher in molecular weight, it loves water, but it dislikes lipids, and it's also charged. It will remain concentrated in the blood because it can't leave the bloodstream. It's too big. And so it will have a low distribution. All right? The next factor is blood flow. So drugs are primarily distributed throughout the body through the blood. And so tissues with high blood flow, such as the heart, the liver, and kidneys should theoretically receive greater drug concentrations than tissues with low blood flow, such as the skin or adipose tissues. Okay, so that's blood flow. 
The next factor is the influence of protein binding. So this can be plasma protein or tissue protein. This is the binding of drugs to certain proteins found in the blood or tissues. And albumin or serum albumin is one of the most important proteins to which drugs can bind. Okay. Protein binding is determined by three factors. We have the concentration of free drugs, their affinity for binding sites, and the concentration of protein. Keep these three factors in mind, okay? Now, only unbound drug molecules are pharmacologically active and can pass through barriers and reach tissues. If the drug molecule binds to a plasma protein, it affects how long the drug remains in the body and how widely it distributes throughout the body. Let's draw this out, focusing on plasma proteins. We said unbound drug molecules, molecules that aren't protein bound, can leave the bloodstream and be distributed. Then we add albumin. Okay, so let's just focus on albumin here. Albumin is a large hydrophilic charge protein that has multiple drug binding sites. Okay, so then talking about its solubility, can albumin cross the membrane? Can this big boy cross the membrane? It's cute, charged, and chunky. So can it? Well, no. It can't easily move out the bloodstream into the tissues because it's large and charged. That's how you'll remember it. Albumin is large and charged, okay? But then what if we put a drug into the bloodstream that is highly plasma protein bound? It will bind to this albumin. It'll hug it, okay? This cute, charged, and chunky protein. Keep in mind that the drug's physicochemical properties determine its binding affinity, okay? So we have the drug molecules binding to albumin. It's cuddling this cute and chunky protein. Given that this is the situation, we have a drug that's highly protein bound. What happens to the distribution of this drug? Let's think about it for a second. Firstly, the actual amount of free drug will decrease because we have a high protein bound drug. So then the amount of drug that's going to be distributed to the tissues is going to decrease. So distribution is going to decrease if we have a drug that is high protein bound. Okay, what else is going to happen? If a drug binds strongly to plasma proteins, it will be retained in plasma because plasma proteins can't leave the bloodstream. Okay, so resulting in an increase in the drug's plasma concentration. Because it's bound to albumin, this protein that can't leave the bloodstream because it's large and charged, <laughs> it's going to be concentrated in the plasma. It's going to be retained in plasma. Okay, resulting in an increase in the drug's plasma concentration. So to recap, if we have a drug that binds significantly to plasma proteins, that means that that drug will be retained in plasma. Since the drug is retained in plasma, distribution will decrease, okay? Let's look at the opposite situation, where we have an increased concentration of free drugs and very little of it is protein bound. It's not attached to albumin. This means there's likely to be an increase in the amount of free drug because very little of it is bound to plasma proteins. It's not really cuddling with albumin. So for example, a patient with liver disease may have reduced albumin production, resulting in lower albumin levels in the blood. As albumin levels fall, the concentration of free unbound drugs in plasma increases, okay? And these free drug molecules can leave the bloodstream and there's an increase in the actual distribution of the drug. It can leave the bloodstream and distribute into tissues or concentrate in the interstitial fluid. Okay, so that's talking about plasma proteins. What about if a drug binds to tissue proteins? This will mean the plasma concentration is decreased because there is a higher distribution in the tissues. If a drug binds to tissue proteins, it will be retained in those tissues. That's protein binding. The next factor is capillary permeability. Capillaries are the smallest blood vessels in the body, consisting of a single layer of endothelial cells surrounded by a basement membrane. This structure allows for the exchange of gases, nutrients, and waste products between the bloodstream and surrounding tissues. Okay, they exhibit varying degrees of permeability depending on their depending on their location and function. Fenestrated capillaries have pores or fenestrations in their endothelial cells facilitating the exchange of larger molecules. We can see this in liver and spleen. 
okay? We also have continuous capillaries with tight junctions between endothelial cells that limit the passage of large molecules, which can be found in the brain. And this brings us to specific barriers that drugs must cross in order to be distributed, and one of which is the blood-brain barrier, which separates the bloodstream from the brain. Let's go through this. Endothelial cells act as a barrier between the brain and capillaries, protecting it from a variety of substances that enter the bloodstream. So it consists of endothelial cells joined by tight junctions. The cells are physically joined together to form a continuous wall. We also have astrocytic end feet and parasites. Drugs must overcome this specific barrier in order to reach the central nervous system and exert their pharmacological effect. It must pass through the endothelial cells of CNS capillaries or be transported actively. Only lipophilic substances or drugs that are actively transported can pass into the central nervous system. That's the blood-brain barrier. Another specific barrier is the placental barrier, the barrier of the placenta in pregnancy. One of the primary functions of the placental barrier is to protect the developing fetus from harmful substances present in the maternal circulation, including toxins, pathogens, and drugs. The thing is, it's not really an efficient barrier because most drugs will cross into the fetus, which might cause congenital malformations. That's why medications for pregnant women have to be carefully prescribed. And the third barrier is the testicular barrier, also known as the blood testes barrier, which protects spermatogenesis from harmful substances. All right, these are the different factors that influence drug distribution. Now let's move on and go through an important parameter in drug distribution, which is called the apparent volume of distribution. This helps us understand the extent to which a drug is distributed beyond the bloodstream into various tissues and compartments. It doesn't represent a real physical volume in the body, but it's a concept used to help understand how extensively a drug has spread beyond the bloodstream. In other words, where in the body is the drug accumulating? Is it in the blood or in the tissue? All of the factors we discussed, such as blood flow, degree of protein binding, and solubility will influence the volume of distribution. Okay, so the apparent volume of distribution is a characteristic of the drug. It's a given value for a drug that is obtained from the PK analysis of clinical trials. Okay, so therefore we can use it to compare the distribution of a drug with the volumes of the body's water compartment despite that it doesn't represent a real physical volume. It's calculated using the equation here. Volume of distribution is equal to the amount of drug absorbed divided by the plasma concentration. VD is generally expressed in liters. Okay, let's break this down. Recall back to the start of the lecture when we talked about body fluid compartments. We said once a drug enters the body, it has the potential to distribute into any of these compartments of body water, plasma, interstitial fluid, and the intracellular compartment. So to understand the concept of volume of distribution, let's think about drug distribution into these different compartments. We're gonna break this down in three categories. We're gonna look at a low volume of distribution, moderate, and a high volume of distribution. Suppose we have a drug, drug A, that remains in the bloodstream, it will have a low volume of distribution because it's concentrated in the bloodstream, in the plasma, and it can't leave to spread throughout the body. So looking at this, what would the drug's characteristics be? What would the reason be for why it's concentrated in the plasma? The drug would either have a high molecular weight, be charged, or be heavily protein bound, which means it wouldn't be able to pass through the capillaries, okay? And this drug will have a volume of distribution that is equivalent to the volume of plasma, 5% of body weight. So let's say, theoretically, the volume of plasma is 4 liters. This drug would have a volume of distribution of 4 liters. Leaders. An example of drug that's retained exclusively in the blood is heparin, which helps to prevent clots from forming in blood vessels, which makes sense why it's retained in plasma. Okay, so that's drug A. It has a low volume of distribution because of the characteristics we discussed. 
Now let's say we have another drug, drug B. And this drug has a higher volume of distribution compared to drug A. It occupies the bloodstream, but it can also move out of the capillaries and into the interstitial fluid. Previously, we said the plasma volume is 4 liters. And theoretically, let's say the interstitial fluid volume is 10 liters. Drug B would occupy both the plasma volume and interstitial, so that's 14 liters. VD of drug B would be around 14 liters. Okay, so then the volume of distribution of this drug will be around 20% of the body weight, the plasma volume plus the interstitial fluid. Okay, now what would drug B's characteristics be? It would be small enough, okay, lower molecular weight, that it can pass through the capillaries, it can move out of the bloodstream, it can have some degree of protein binding, but it can, again, it can also move out. So a slightly higher volume of distribution will indicate that the drug is beginning to leave the bloodstream. An example of a drug that is going into plasma and starts to distribute into the extra fluids is glabenclamide, which is used to treat type 2 diabetes. All right? Okay. So we've looked at low distribution, moderate, and now let's consider a drug with a very high volume of distribution. This drug, drug C, it has a low molecular weight, it's non-polar and lipid soluble, and it's not protein bound, it's not bound to albumin. This drug can leave the bloodstream and it can occupy the extracellular space and pass through into the intracellular fluid. It can enter specific tissues such as adipose. Drug C is occupying and distributing to all compartments. It's occupying the bloodstream, the interstitial fluid, and inside the tissues. If the drug, in this case drug C, is going to go into all the body fluids, the volume of distribution will be of the same value as the total water in the body, which is around, we said, around 60% of body weight. And a great example of this is ethanol or aspirin. The drug is going to go into all the body fluids, and so the volume of distribution will be the same value as the total body of water. Okay? Now, when the volume of distribution is much higher than the total volume of body water, this indicates that the drug is concentrating into specific tissues, such as adipose tissues. It's significantly leaving the bloodstream and concentrating into specific tissues. And what can this tell us about the drug's characteristics? It's small and lipophilic, so it's not plasma protein bound, so it can leave the bloodstream and enter fatty tissues, resulting in a greater apparent volume of distribution that is much higher than total body water. Okay, An example of this is morphine, which tends to concentrate in adipose tissues. So by stepping back and thinking about the properties of the drug, the substance, it can help us know its apparent volume of distribution. All right, That was a lot. Before we end this lecture, let's quickly summarize what we've just covered on volume of distribution. If a drug has a small volume of distribution, it's mostly staying in your bloodstream. And if a drug has a high volume of distribution, it means it has spread out a lot into your body's tissues. And if the volume of distribution is greater than that of the total body water, then that means it's concentrating in specific tissues. Thank you for watching this video. Make sure you subscribe to EKG Science so you don't miss a single lecture. And remember, subtract complexity and slow down. To study the next lecture, simply click the next video or you can view the entire playlist.